What's up and welcome back. Today we're talking about Dragon Ball Super Chapter 68. Now there's a lot of stuff in this chapter, especially in regards to Granola, his motivations, and some very interesting Whis stuff and a lot of setup for what's to come. Um, so right off the bat, you'll notice the amount of detail in these first few pages, especially this cover page with Granola and Goku just kind of standing there. Uh, nice bit of shading, good art stuff there, but the first page, immediately I noticed the amount of detail in this. Like, I'm thinking, did Toyotaro really do this? <laughs> like, how much time did he take into making this page? But uh, it's interesting because um, instead of having like a white border between the panels, you got a black border, and that really is telling of like the nightmare nature that Granola is having, because this is all a nightmare of when the Saiyan Great Apes attacked his people. Um, and he runs into a church and then we see Bardock <laughs> as a Great Ape. Now I really hope, and I really, really hope that this is the last we see of Bardock because I do not care about Bardock at all. We've had enough of Bardock. I'm done with him, <laughs> you know? Uh, just have him in the video games or whatever, that's fine. But if he is in it more via flashbacks or whatever, it would make sense since this ties directly into Granola's motivations, which is going to be basically a revenge plot against Frieza and the Saiyans. But I thought this was a good way to establish Granola's motivations via, via Nightmare. And uh, he was talking to Oatmeal, and Oatmeal seems to be like his ship's AI, which I got a comment about in my last video, so that definitely seems to be the case here. And uh, they're talking about the, the barbarous apes, and they feel the need to remind the audience, hey, remember that the Saiyans can turn into apes, so those apes were Saiyans. Um, I thought that was funny because it's been a long time since we've actually seen a great ape in the series, as far as I remember at least. But speaking of apes, we cut to Goku on Beerus' planet trying to catch the oracle fish because the oracle fish apparently is having a lot of trouble sleeping. And that was an interesting parallel between the oracle fish and Granola. So they inject him with some vitamins and put him to sleep basically. And Whis reveals that the oracle fish having insomnia is basically a bad omen for the future. And which seems to be referring to Granola and his adventures out there in space. And of course we have our one note Goku in Dragon Ball Super. Oh, shot, that's cool. Maybe I'll get a strong fighter now. And I'm like, dude, just go and revive Moro with the Dragon Balls. Like you were so stubborn about killing him in the first place. Why don't you just use the Dragon Balls to bring him back to life for, for like an hour so you can spar with him. And then Vegeta says, will you ever learn your lesson, man? And I'm like, no, no, he won't ever learn your lesson. And Vegeta, you won't ever learn your lesson either because Dragon Ball is so hung up on its own tropes that it can seemingly never move past them. And Beerus is all annoyed about this because, you know, that's been Beerus' character. The entirety of Dragon Ball Super is eating, not getting involved, and being annoyed at Goku. Uh, but that is until a little bit later on in this chapter. But first, we actually get some good old action between Ultra Instinct to Goku and Whis. And this time, Whis attacks. Most of the time when we see Whis training with Goku and Vegeta, he is just dodging and then maybe like does a little neck karate chop kind of thing. But this is the most action we've ever seen from Whis, apart from the video games of course. He's actually punching at Goku and kicking at him. And of course he sees right through Goku's after image strategy, jumps up to the sky and kicks his ass down to the ground, right back into base form. Which of course would be Whis, I mean last arc, he stopped Planetary Moro's punch with like one hand easily. So of course Goku's not gonna lay a finger on uh, Whis right now. And so Beerus basically interestingly says, you know, Whis isn't exactly using Ultra Instinct. That's kind of their base form. Like their base is Ultra Instinct. So Goku has reached the very base base <laughs> of what angels are capable of, I suppose. Um, so Vegeta annoyingly, very annoyingly, there's one panel where Vegeta is just annoyed when Goku goes into Ultra Instinct, and I hated this. 
I hated this so much. I am so sick and tired of Vegeta always. Now this is what I'm talking about. Tr Dragon Ball doing its own tropes over and over and over again and not evolving at all. And it's just Vegeta being annoyed at Goku achieving something is is so stupid now. It's just stupid. Like, I've, it, wouldn't it be great if Vegeta changed? I thought he might have changed in the last arc, they, but no, it was just, it was just uh, an illusion of change, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, but he basically says, you know, he has, you know, obtained Ultra Instinct, but I'll surpass him again one one day. Which is probably true, but Goku is so far above right now, it's hard to imagine how. That is, until Beerus reveals what he's gonna reveal. But first, we go back to Whis and Goku, and Whis is basically explaining that, you know, even though you have obtained Ultra Instinct, you still got a long way to go to reach my levels. You know, you may, might have reached Maris levels, but he was the bottom of the barrel, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, the Grand Priest is way up there, and then there's me, and then there's Maris and you, so. <laughs> uh, and I thought it was funny that Goku actually says, I'm stoked. I love I love these translations sometimes. Um, so, speaking of Beerus and Vegeta, um, Beerus asks Vegeta, hey, are you going to master Ultra Instinct 2? And Vegeta says, nah, it doesn't suit me, which I like. I do like that Vegeta and Goku are going their separate ways in terms of how they evolve their powers. And Beerus reveals, Ultra Instincts ain't the only technique of the gods. Now this is some crazy stuff. Like, what is Beerus alluding to? Like, does he have some sort of special, aside from Ultra Instinct, like another type of kind of power up or something? I guess, or transformation? I don't know, but uh, it's, it's very mysterious and intriguing, that's for damn sure. Um, so Beerus says, instead of being lazy like he usually is, which is weird, he's like, I'm gonna go train, and if you happen to see me do stuff, you know, I'm not gonna train you, but if you happen to see it, you know, you can use it if you want, it's whatevs. <laughs> uh, so that, I thought that was kind of cool. But seems kind of like just a way to keep Vegeta relevant to Goku um, in terms of overall power. And, but who knows, maybe the technique is like turning their bodies into pure destruction energy or something crazy like that. So, but in terms of Goku surpassing Beerus, like it's, it's happened, he has surpassed him. But now, given this information, with this technique that Beerus is alluding to, has Goku really, really surpassed him? Now, I've always been an advocate of, yeah, he probably has, especially with mastering Ultra Instinct, or being able to do Ultra Instinct on command. Um, he probably has uh, surpassed Beerus, but we haven't seen it yet, and they haven't definitively said Goku has surpassed Beerus. They they always add like a little caveat, like he might have surpassed him, and then you get Beerus' reactions. Um, but now with this revelation of this new like way of Gods of Destruction kind of powering up or having this special technique, um, it's a little bit more questionable now, I guess. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, drop your thought waves in the comments. But we go back to Granola, and we, it is revealed why Granola went to get 7-3, and that is because he wants some money. <laughs> Not because he wanted 7-3's information, but the other guys wanted 7-3's information, which makes sense because 7-3 shouldn't have Moral's copy anymore or anything like that. Uh, but he should have like his six experiences, which is telling me that this might be how Granola learns of the Saiyans, or he might learn it from Frieza because we get more information later on down the road. Uh, but this other like bounty hunter tr tries to get in on the action of 7-3 and getting that easy money, you know what I'm saying? Splitting it with the Granola. Um, so he goes in to see this group of thugs, which are called the Heaters, and their names are very interesting because they have something to do with uh, heating fuels like oil and gas. And then there's Elec, which is a really creative name for electricity. <laughs> um, so, 
Um, he hands over 7-3 and they give him the money and he says, hey, you know, we are out to become the power of the universe. You know, strength isn't all that matters. Uh, information is what gives you power and money is what gives you power. So I thought that was interesting because Frieza, Frieza's whole thing is like brute force and ruling the universe with an iron fist. Uh, based on how powerful he is. But these guys are gonna base it off of intelligence, uh, in intel, and money, basically. So it's kind of another way to go about it, although if Frieza went to fight them, like, I don't know, how is intelligence gonna beat them from a freaking golden Frieza, you know what I'm saying? So Elec reveals that Frieza has been revived from the dead. So this guy has the intel. And Granola gets extremely excited about this because he can now get his revenge that he's been craving and maybe stop the nightmares. Um, so, but Gas, he starts stepping up to Elec and Gas goes over and trips him. And I'm like, oh, like maybe Granola is not as powerful as we might have thought because last time he defeated all those like 7 3 models. But as I said, those 7 3 don't models don't have copy abilities, so we don't know how strong those guys are. So Granola probably isn't nearly as powerful as we all might have thought to begin with. So just like Moro, he's starting off relatively weak, and then by the end of this arc, he's just gonna be a strong guy for Goku and Vegeta to fight. Uh, looking forward to that. <laughs> so he ends up leaving thinking, okay, now I gotta go find Frieza, and I'm gonna get revenge. Uh, while Elex says, we gotta get rid of this Granola guy because he's getting stronger and stronger as the days go by, and we need to do something about this. But of course, since we haven't had much action in this chapter yet, we have to have an action scene between Granola and these, uh, the guy from before that wanted to take 7-3 and his money, so he goes to try to take his money. And I thought this was kind of a cool scene. He blasts his ship, and then he says, hey, hand over your money or I'll blast you into space dust. And then he just lets Granola go land on an asteroid. Why did he let him do that? Why didn't, didn't he just blast him into space dust and then go gather his money, you know? So like a badass, Granola snipes all of them and lets the one guy go, but really two guys because he reveals that he missed a guy when he was sniping. And I went back to this page and there's this tiny speck where you see that he did in fact miss this guy. Uh, what happened to this dude? He wasn't on the ship with, uh, what's his name? Like, not Sashimi, but Susuro or something like that. Anyway, he, he lets him get away. So I'm thinking he's probably gonna be back in the future. And Granola missing that one dude prompts him to realize he is not ready to face Frieza. Now, I really doubt that Granola knows about Golden Frieza and Frieza's training and Resurrection F stuff, so he's probably thinking about Frieza on Namek. And is he thinking about full power Frieza? Like final form Frieza? Frieza had never shown his final form until Namek. So he's probably thinking about first form Frieza with a power level of 530,000. So how strong really is Granola? Now this, to me, I really like it because it really makes sense because Frieza in his first form was the domin dominator of the galaxy or the universe. Um, so this really makes sense that nobody can even touch even first form Frieza except for the Earthlings. Uh, so this is really cool, and I'm really wondering how the hell is Granola gonna get strong enough to fight Frieza? Especially these freaking god-tier villains. He doesn't have Moro's energy-stealing technique. He doesn't have access to a hyperbolic time chamber. Like, how is this... It, maybe he'll acquire uh, 7-3's copy orb and retrofit it into, like, his eye thing? Ooh, that'd be crazy. But the big cliffhanger of this chapter is Oracle Fish sleeping, talking in his sleep and saying the balance is going to shift. And when he said this, I thought, okay, the balance of Frieza's empire shifting to the Heater's empire. Uh, which is very cool because I love how there you got Frieza and Cooler and Frost. And get it? that Like the ice puns and then you have the heating puns. 
that are going to be the rulers of the galaxy now. So I, I really love that dynamic. And Oracle Fish said, the strongest warrior in the universe will soon rise up. Now he could be thinking of a couple of different people here. Obviously, the no, the number one thing pe person you think he's talking about is Granola, right? Because you just saw Granola talking about getting strong enough to defeat Frieza. Number two, earlier in the chapter, we had Beerus going to train and basically show Vegeta this new mysterious technique that the Gods of Destruction apparently can do, which could put him on the level of Ultra Instinct. And then three, you have Goku, who is the current... Uh, strongest warrior in the universe. So it could either be Vegeta and Granola, it's probably Granola since it's the Oracle Fish uh, seeing stuff in the future, or it could be talking about Frieza, who knows? Uh, but you got these these four threads. You have Goku and Whis, you have Beerus and Vegeta, and this could possibly be setting up Vegeta to become a god of destruction, which I don't know if I would really like that. I don't think Vegeta would really want to do that job, you know what I'm saying? Um, and you got three, uh, Granola and his quest for revenge, and then you got four, the Heaters versus Frieza's Empire. So this chapter was a really great start to setting up this uh, arc. A lot of really intriguing elements to it. Um, not much action in it, but... Uh, it had a lot of stuff to set up, so looking forward to what happens in the future and to see how Granola will come into contact with uh, the good guys. Oh, I forgot to to mention that the Elec, the heater leader, heater leader, <laughs> uh, was going to go to Zuno. Uh, so I wonder how 7-3, and that's why they wanted 7-3, I wonder how 7-3 has information on, on Zuno. Uh, maybe it's from one of his copies that he did. I don't know. If you remember or know, drop your thought waves down in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching and take it easy.